Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a size-inclusive bike community. So join your hosts. I'm Maggie. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies, but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Oh, hey. Well, welcome to All Bodies on Bikes. This is a podcast where all bodies are good buddies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. I am uh, one of the people that likes to talk here, and my name is Maggie, and the other person that likes to talk here is Marley. Hey, Marley. Hi. Hey, Maggie. How you doing? I'm swelling yourself. Uh, it's an ice storm outside currently, and so, so I'm not... swell. Oh, I, I hate it. It like looks pretty like it's snow, but it's just ice chunks, and it's been like thunder icing, which I didn't know was a thing. Interesting. Yeah. That feels like one of the weird uh, social media animal names. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like a danger noodle. What would a thunder a thunder ice be? Would that be a polar bear? Yeah, I think so. Okay. A thunder yeah, ice. Thunder ice. I yeah. like that. Yep. We used to get thunder snow in Seattle and I haven't experienced that in Arkansas. Um, yeah. All the thunderstorms here have been like, you know, it's really warm out and then you see a cold front moving in and it's like warm to cold. But today it was thunder icing. So I don't know. Thunder icing. That'd also be a great wrestling name. <laughs> Just throwing it out there if somebody wants to use that. Why don't we have bike names? Like they have wrestling names. Oh, they should. Maybe we could start that. What would yours be? Oh, gosh. Um, oh, gosh. Sorry, I kind of put you on the spot. No, I'm trying to decide. It has, and it's got, I don't want to use the word slow, but something with like leisure snacks. That's what we're going to go with. <laughs> leisure snacks. Yes. <laughs> I'm in the back and I'm bringing food. That is excellent. Um, I was thinking something like look pro go slow for me. Oh, I like that. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Uh, Cause I might have all the gear and the fancy bikes, but I'm not fast at all. I mean, you know, but you're having fun. Oh, always. And that's what matters. I, why else would I ride a bike? Exactly. <laughs> well, some people ride for other reasons, but um, <laughs> should we talk about our guest for today? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, I'm really excited. I met Nikki probably three or four years ago now, um, just over Instagram when um, I think it was when we were doing like the with these thighs hashtag. Um, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but Nikki and I have never actually met in person. Um, there was that whole pandemic thing. But now we have plans to meet in April because Nikki is now really involved in all bodies on bikes. Heck yeah. Um, so I guess I should read her official intro. Uh, Nikki Bates lives in Detroit, Michigan, and is a cyclist in her spare time and an advocate for bicyclists by day at her job with the League of Michigan Bicyclists. Her favorite post-ride or anytime food is nachos and is moving to Marquette, Michigan in two months to be closer to her favorite activities, backpacking, gravel single track riding, and swimming in a great lake. Thanks for joining us today, Nikki. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Ah! Bikes with anyone, anytime. So I, I love it. I um, so I actually just got back from Cortez, Colorado, um, mm. talking about backpacking. Um, I really want to get more into it, but one of the things that's limited me is having a pack that fits. Um, and I was just working with a brand who's working on an extended size launch. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that is very exciting because I my body changed pretty significantly between the time when I bought my first backpack and like now. And so sometimes I go to use my pack and it is not fitting quite right. So I would upgrade to one that fit better in a heartbeat if it existed. So that is really good to know. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think they're launching in like a month or two. So, um, and it's really, so a lot of brands that I work with, you know, say they're working on extended sizing and it's like, okay, cool. You're going up to size 20 or three X this one. It's going up to 70 inches on the waistband which is nice. pretty darn inclusive as I've looked at size charts. I think that's about a 5X. Um, so hopefully it'll open up more opportunities for lots of folks. That's yeah. awesome because I think not to get on a backpacking tangent, but I think a lot of people don't realize that like, I'm like a big pack mule. I 
me and my skinny little dad go on backpacking trips together and I can carry a lot more weight than he can, which might be age related, but also like, I feel like I'm like a, a workhorse, right? You just, yeah, I don't know. Like backpacking is a great sport for people who are heavier. And so, oh, definitely. Yeah. Because to that gear is really awesome. Yeah. I always like think of, there's an episode of New Girl and uh, Schmidt is wrestling with his cousin and he's like flashing back to wrestling with his cousin and his cousin has pinned him to the ground. And like one of the whole things is that Schmidt was larger when he was younger yeah. and the dude pins him and screams, I'm the strong kind of fat. And I don't know how they meant it on the show, but like that powers me through things. Oh, 100%. like I'll get really upset about a situation that I'm in and just be like, just stop and be like, I'm the strong kind of fat and I can do whatever I was trying to get done. Talking about merch, yeah. I would buy that shirt. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Oh my gosh. I love it. Yes. Motivational quotes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, we are here to talk about bikes today. Um, and Nikki, you are our, I was going to say our Detroit chapter leader, but that's going to be changing to Marquette. So obviously you're into bikes. You work for the League of Michigan Bicyclists. How did you get into bicycles? Yes. So I um, was very active when I was younger. I played soccer. I swam a lot. Um, I swam competitively for many years. I'm a self identified water baby. I will jump in whatever body of water is closest to me as soon as I can. Um, me too. And, me yeah, three. Just the best, especially <laughs> if you can combine bikes and water, like a bike. <laughs> anyway, just my favorite thing. Um, and so I started, I went to college and I graduated from college and I was like, you need an activity that isn't drinking a lot of beer and walking to class because that was all I had done for the previous four years. And so I started swimming again and I heard about running <laughs> and I was like, this is a thing that people do. And so I started doing that. <laughs> Do my first 5K. Um, and at that 5K, the group that put it on also put on a all women's like beginner triathlon. Very I was, cool. I can do all three of those things. I have a little bit of this like, I can do anything, Gene, which is both lovely and dangerous. Um, and so I signed up for this sprint triathlon and it sort of it sort of went from there. I had a coworker, luckily, who um was very into bikes and helped me buy my first used big old steel frame road bike that weighed like 50 pounds, but got me through my first couple of races. And, um, yeah, took, he took me out on bike rides and group rides. And, um, I think that was sort of really what brought me in was that I realized there was this whole community of people like in Detroit, there's a different group ride every night of the week, pretty much that you can pick from. And a lot of them have three or four different pace groups they'll break up into, or, you know, this is the faster one, this is the slower one. So the community really, really drew me in and kept me coming back. So yeah. That's so cool. Um, I remember watching a documentary one time about this. I think it's like the Detroit slow roll. Mm. Uh, have you ever gotten a chance to do that? I have. Yes. It doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, oh. um, it became really difficult and expensive to put on because there were as many as like 10,000 people doing it. On wow. Saturday. And so <laughs> they required so much like police blocking the intersections and stuff like that. Cause it was just miles long <laughs> so um but yeah it was a really cool thing while it was happening and I mean I just remember one time seeing somebody pulling a like one of those like kitty like a kid carrier behind their bike and being like oh cool it's such like a family fun thing but it was full of like a cooler full of beer um but certainly <laughs> there were many people who came with their kids and stuff so yeah that was a really cool community community event yeah yeah but, I just remember watching that documentary and there was a bunch of like custom bicycles um, like yeah. the, the kind of laid back, almost like motorcycle the style, the low riders. And that was the first time I'd really kind of seen that there's all these different cultural elements to cycling. You know, I think a lot of us are just in like that. We're going to ride gravel and we're going to wear Lycra and go fast or, or try and go fast, but there's so many different ways to ride a bike. And that really opened my eyes to that. There's actually, there's a group here called, I believe it's GMA, but I think the women's one is GWAB, which is grown men on bikes and grown women on bikes. Um, and they have not quite matching, but they make their own denim vests, which is kind of cool. Yes. Um, but yeah, and then those are like the GMOB guys are the ones who have super bright lights and bright colors. And like, they've completely reworked their bikes to be all kinds of different shapes. And yeah, it is cool to, it's cool, like bike watching, honestly. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'll have to look that up and we'll include it in the show notes for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you went from like triathlon um, and sounds like longer road riding. Um, what kind of riding is that still the kind of riding you do today or what um, gets your gears turning now? 
Um, what well, gets my gears turned? I like that question. Uh-huh. Um, I am my road bike now is more of a trainer bike than anything else. Sadly, I really like it. It fits me really well, but I don't do a ton of road riding anymore. I mostly have switched to gravel. Um, in 2019, I did a half Ironman, which was a really big deal. Um, so that's a 1.2 mile swim, a 56 mile bike ride, and a half marathon. Uh, and I've joked for a long time that I'm just about recovered from it now. You know, four years later. Um, well, I like how casually you just like. Sleep in and you know I did like a half Iron Man, <laughs> which is funny because I think like I I work out with way too many people who do full Iron Mans regularly enough and I'm like no oh, it's just a half and I'm like no that was a big deal and you're like I spent six months training for it and so um I loved like the bike portion of that event it was really cool the half marathon about did me in but um the the biking is what and like that was sort of my entrance into longer distance bike rides was that summer that I spent doing you know. 40, 50 mile rides to get ready for that, for that race. So yeah, um, no more half Ironmans for me, probably. I don't want to run that much anymore, but, um, but the, the long distance rides are, are, are here to stay for a while, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, rides, I know also that you, not just the half Ironman, but like really enjoy doing races. Yeah. What are, like, tell us some of your favorite stories or something tell us about your racing career I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say yeah that my racing career I like that <laughs> yeah I think because I I came into biking through triathlon that racing was just what I knew to go do and so it was a pretty natural segue for me um I didn't race a lot during 2020 because nobody did um and sort of <laughs> coming up with that uh in 2020 I bought a gravel bike I bought a salsa journeyman um my bike shop, uh, which I could talk about for ages, how much I love them. They, um, the, the wheels that came on my, my gravel bike were terrible. They were breaking. I, I broke a spoke every other ride. And so they built me a, a custom set of wheels and then the spoke broke again and they rebuilt, they hand rebuilt my wheels, I think three different times. And like the entire time where they were like finding solutions left and right to the point that I have not had an issue now in like a year and a half. And so, um, yeah, that, that was not quite the question that you asked, but that was uh, buying the gravel bike really got me into gravel racing, which is mostly what I do now. Um, and it would not have happened without the support from my bike shop um, being super cool. And, um, you know, there's skinny bike dudes like any other bike shop, but they were pretty immediately like, oh, no, like we can just make your bike tire, you make your spokes invincible and make your wheels like a lot stronger. And that's enabled me to do some pretty cool things. Um, I've done Barry Roubaix, which is a big gravel bike race here in Michigan that has four distance options from 18 miles to a hundred miles. Um, there is I love, sorry to interrupt you. I love events like that where it yeah. does, they have that variety of distances. So yeah. whatever type of rider you are, you could have that event experience. I I also love that. And that is something that I, uh, Pavement Ends is the name of the team that puts on Barry Roubaix. Um, and I, it, you know, there are some other gravel races here in Michigan that focus on much longer distances. And so I always am like, you know, I don't necessarily need every race to have those options, but for a race that is that big of a deal in Michigan to offer an 18 miler um, and to offer like other distance options for people is, is really incredible because you get to be a part of it too. And um, that is something that I think that gravel people, like people who work in gravel racing or who are race directors can do to really make their race more accessible to more people. So, yeah. And we're going to get into it. That's kind of the main thing we want to talk to you about because you do have so much experience with racing. Um, but I want to revisit the bike shop. Um, do you want to shout them out? Um, let's give credit where credit's due. You know what? I sure do. Metropolis in Detroit, Michigan. They're opening a second location in Ferndale. They just announced this week, which is another Detroit suburb. Um, if you are anywhere near the Detroit area, I, I cannot recommend them enough. Um, they have really taken the time to get to know me as a person and as an athlete and they make really helpful, sensible recommendations based on that. Um, and they're just, they're all around good people. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah. thanks to yeah. Metropolis. Um, yeah. We'll, way to go Metropolis. We'll mm-hmm. include a link to them in our, in our bio, but um, you know, for any shop owners or employees, um, you know, the everyday interactions you have with folks, it might not be a big deal to you to say, let's rebuild your wheels, or I know what your problem is. But yeah. for those of us that have been left out for so long, it really does make a big difference. So good yeah. job there. And that's, I mean, that was one of the first things that I came in. I was like, my spokes are breaking. And they were like, we can use e-bike nipples because they're meant to handle more weight. Um, and I was like, I yeah. shouldn't giggle. <laughs> I know. I know. I, love every time too. <laughs> I was actually kind of impressed. I said it with a straight face. <laughs> 
Oh, these are my people. All right. <laughs> and these are these are my. There's a reason people. we have the explicit warning, <laughs> even though I don't think we've ever. Anyway, maybe it's just preemptive. Should we just start doing one an episode? Yes. <laughs> just a random <laughs> outburst. All right, understood. I'll take that on personally. <laughs> Um, so like at the barrier bay, they have those distances like 18 to 100 miles. What is your like sweet spot? Oof. Um, so Detroit is a very flat place. And so this race takes place in Grand Rapids just on the other side of the state. And so I last year went back and forth with myself for like the weeks leading up to it and was like, I was signed up for the 18. And I was like, do the 36. You can ride 36 miles. That was, I'm pretty sure if you look at my stats from the day, it is a nonstop like four miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. Like it was just me going up and down these hills very slowly and then descending very quickly. Yes. Um, it also had snowed a ton the night before, which I personally love. I love. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a winter gal. It doesn't, as long as it's not icy, I'm unbothered. Um, okay. I'm I, on board with that. I yeah. Same. Eat. Do not ask me to do anything if it's more than like 75 degrees outside. And <laughs> yes. so I feel like then I have to be tough on the other end, which is fine. Yes. It doesn't bother me that much. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I did my, in on a flatter course, my sweet spot is probably in like the 30 to 60 mile range. But for Barry Bay, I was really glad that I stuck with the 18 because those hills were, for Michigan, they are quite, it's quite hilly, quite a hilly course. So yeah. And hills can make such a difference. I remember at rooted Vermont last year. Um, I remember looking at the course before and it was like, okay, 48 miles. I think it was like 6,500 feet of elevation. And I didn't realize what that actually meant. Yeah. I have never had a harder day on the bike. And like, I ride hills often, but these were just so steep. Yes. And that changes it too, right? If you have many sort of like slow rolling hills, the elevation adds up. But then if you have a situation where you're basically just hiking, like climbing up a mountain or up a giant hill, it's not, it's a very different feeling than rolling hills. So, yes. Yeah. That yeah. started, I, cause I always, when I go out for a ride, I'm looking at elevation, but have finally started to be like, okay, but also what's the grade? Yes. Because that's caught me off guard a couple of times and ruined a day. Yeah. yeah. Although good. sometimes I'm not going to lie. I kind of miss my world of biking before I had access to all that information. And I just like had vague stats of like, I'm going out for apparently a hard 50 mile ride. Yeah. <laughs> and I like had the cue sheets written down, like in my handlebar bag. Nowadays, you know, I've got a Wahoo, I've got all the devices, but there was something nice about, you know, not knowing what elevation was coming up and now it tells me you have three more climbs I'm like I didn't need to know that I will prefer that over uh specifically I'm thinking about the half Ironman that I did which was in a very like hilly place and that was probably like 3,500 feet of climbing over 56 miles which for me was <sighs> a lot and there were at least three different times where people who had like come out to cheer were like this is the last hill and they were wrong yeah and so <laughs> I don't like to wish ill on people. I just wish them some more sense because that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's my gosh. the last one and then like see two more ahead. And I'm like, why did you tell me that? You should like, it, when you're doing an event, you should get a carton, not right now, but like in the past, a carton yeah. of eggs. We can't afford it currently. But just if anybody says the sentence at any point to you on the ride, this yeah. is the last hill. You get to chuck yeah. an egg at them. Even if it is the last hill, don't tell me. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. I'm dying and I need to make it to the top. Yes, that's perfect. Um, that are people who say you're almost there. What oh. does that mean to you? Is almost there five miles? I'm not almost there until I can see the finish line. Like that is, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. such a good point. Um, cool. Well, let's talk about some of the challenges um, you've experienced with racing. So aside from hills, which yeah. regardless of who you are, they're, they're a challenge. Um, yeah. What other obstacles or barriers have you run into? I'm slow right? Like I'm just like not moving as fast. I, I sort of joke that I'm like fast to slow people and slow to fast people. Right. So like my friends who don't ride bikes think that I'm like the fastest human being alive. And like the people that I do ride bikes with are all much faster than me. <laughs> so, um, I, I, so some, something like, I guess the biggest challenge that I run into is time cutoffs. Um, and so I did Iceman, which is a big mountain bike race here in Michigan. Um, is that the Iceman cometh? Yes. Okay. I've seen that yeah, on Instagram nice. and I've always wanted to go, but too cold for me. The, the experience of it is cool. Even if you aren't riding and they have, they, they do have a shorter ride option, which I probably should have signed up for, but I was like 30 miles. That's not bad. Oof. Oh, <laughs> oh, Nikki, <laughs> eight months before the race. Um, uh, so I, 
uh, in that one, you are seated. You start, you start at like different times based on your wave. And I said, put me in the back wave. I don't want to be riding near anybody else. I am like not as comfortable on single track as I am on, you know, like on a gravel race, people can just pass me. That's fine. Um, I also have, you know, something I'm working on. I'm just like a people pleaser. So the thought of inconveniencing the people behind me makes me want to die. And so I have to pull over and like, let them pass. Relatable. Um, Yes. And so I was like at the very back of the, um, I, I was like, put me in the last wave. They did. Um, but putting me in the last wave meant that I didn't make it to the cutoff point. So I made it 17 miles of the 27 mile race when I got pulled off the course because the pros come through after. So they have to take you off the course because they put the pros last. So everybody can watch the pros finish at the end. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes sense for most people who do the race and not me, but um, I, the real kicker was that the juniors came through after me also. And I was thinking like, oh, cute little kids. No, these are like 17 year old boys who are just as fast as the guys in the first wave. <laughs> like, yeah. um, so they were the most polite children I've ever interacted with ever. Like they were so friendly and nice and like, have a good ride, ma'am. And I was like, I'm not that old, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I was like off my bike, like trying to let them pass me. And yeah, it was a beautiful day. Uh, I really liked the course, but yeah, time cutoffs are, are a real, are a real mess. And so I'm, that's one of the things I really appreciate about gravel riding is that time cutoffs are, are usually much less of a big deal because if on road races and triathlons, they have to turn the roads back over, they can only block them off for so long, but on some random little two track where you might only get three ATVs every other day anyway, it doesn't matter how long you take. Um, and that's sort of something I like to tell people who want to get interest, who want to get into gravel riding is pick a race like Barry Roubaix, where they have multiple distance options and you're not doing the longest one because yeah, 18 miles took me a while. It didn't take me as long as a hundred miles took everybody <laughs> took the people who did that distance. Right. And, um, yeah. So I think that's, that's really like the main challenge that I've faced with that. Um, other than I'm tired of being the only fat woman at events and I would love to see other fat people come to the bikes with me, but, um, yeah, yeah. I, I said that too. And then last year at Steamboat Gravel, um, I think every fat woman on our team got called Marley at least once. Uh, <laughs> there used to only be a few of us. Now we're taking over. <laughs> and over. Yeah. Um, back to the time cutoff thing. I had a really interesting conversation with Christy Moan and Catherine Taylor on Girls Gone Gravel. It's another podcast about this mm -hmm. because um, they're word to the wise, there are time cutoffs on some events. Um, and that's just because of, you know, what they have to do. Um, I'm speaking about unbound in particular, they do have a time cutoff. And in 2022, um, I guess just this past year, I did the hundred miler and I made the time cutoff by like three seconds, but I was so stressed out. Um, and, you know, just talking with the event directors about why they have to do it. And it, it makes sense for logistical purposes, um, but it definitely adds another element to it. And like the time cutoff, you have to be going like you have to average 10 miles an hour, which doesn't sound fast until you're climbing up giant grades and having mechanical issues and wanting and to three feet of time. mud. Yeah, they, they stop and take a break. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, basically in my training for Unbound, I trained to not take breaks, um, to eat on the bike, which is not the style of riding that I love. Um, but yeah. I learned that I can do it. Um, oh. you mentioned being the only fat woman at races. Have you ever run into any issues with, um, like Jersey sizing or swag, um, stuff like that? Um, yes, that is something like, uh, there are a couple of Barry Bay jerseys that I really like, but they stop at like a, I think they go up to like a two X, which is just like, not quite, which like in, I can wear like a two X unisex t-shirt, but in cycling clothes, as we all know, it runs much smaller than that. Yeah. It's basically um, medium. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And I actually just had two. I went to go sign up for a women's mountain biking clinic uh, that was here in Michigan and their sizes stopped at like a large or an extra large for t-shirt, like for event t-shirts. And I was like, that's a big red flag. Like if you aren't, if, if, if I am not like being included in your registration process, what's going to happen when I show up at the event, you know? And so like that to me is a big, like if you aren't offering all available, like as many available sizes as you can. And also companies like Primal that do a lot of the custom jerseys go up to a five or six X. Like there's very little excuse to not offer as many sizes as possible to people. Um, yeah. 
Yes. I remember two years ago, my first year at Steamboat, um, I remember they were using Primal as their custom kit maker. Um, oh. And I was sponsored by Pearl, so I didn't necessarily need a kit, but I saw that they were using Primal and on their website, they only went up to like an XL on the size chart for Steamboat. And so I just reached out to the organizer and said, hey guys, is there a reason that they don't have the full Primal size line? And they said, absolutely not. We're going to fix that right away. So oftentimes it's just like either oversight or I don't want to say ignorance, um, but if you don't live in a larger body, you might not even think about it, which is why we're having these conversations to try and yeah. make folks aware that Absolutely. we're here, we ride bikes, we want clothes to do it again. Yes, which yeah. the machines for freedom closing, I can't even talk about oh. that. But um, just stock up now, I saw a bunch on sale. Oh, I, that's what I should do. Yeah. Um, like two hours staring at a wall on Friday being like, do you spend $500 on two bibs? It's like, <laughs> Probably not, but I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's, that's a huge thing too, especially with, I mean, having close to cycling in general is a really good and powerful thing, but that's a real sense of belonging to be able to like, I came and I did the same race that my friends did, even if they did a longer one or a faster one or whatever. And I want to feel included in this. And so I think it's a really like, it's a, it seems sort of like a quote unquote little thing, but it's really not, it's really a um, sort of a signifier of like who belongs in what place. Um, and so, yeah, extend your sizes, race directors, please. Yeah. Oh, very well said. Um, so uh, lots of folks listening, I'm sure are thinking, well, Nikki sounds like, you know, perfectly reasonable person. I'd like to go ride bikes with her. Um, but maybe they're intimidated or scared to show up to a race or an event. Do you have advice for those folks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say number one, I, I obviously can't say I've interacted with every race director who has ever existed, but the ones that I have interacted with um, are not like scary people, right? They, and they're maybe they kind of maybe come across as like very intense or like very, like they might be like very fast or whatever, but people who, who make the switch from becoming racers to becoming a race director do it because they love this sport more than like almost anybody else does. <laughs> like they love riding bikes so much that they want to watch other people do it on a beautiful Saturday afternoon when they could be out. <laughs> so that, is, that is some commitment. And so um, I have been in situations where I have like reached out and asked race directors about cutoff times and things like that. And I have never gotten a bad response from anyone. I mean, I've, I've gotten like a yeah, sorry, that's the cutoff time. Here's why that has to be that way, but nobody is ever rude. And so I think if, um, I think there are things that sort of like with the sizing thing that race directors maybe aren't aware of that they could be doing to make races a more welcoming place for people who aren't super fast um, or who are going slower. Um, but I think in general, they are cool, chill people who want more people to ride bikes. Um, and that is a mission that I share. Um, I also think that if you're nervous, um, definitely look into picking a race where you're not doing the longest distance, like I mentioned earlier, and don't be afraid to reach out to the race organizers and to the race director. And I mean, as someone who worked in event planning for several years, I have to say, please don't reach out to them like the week of the race, if you can help it at all. Um, Great call out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but please reach out to them and ask like, what are, what is like, uh, I did a race earlier. Or I did a race last, last fall. That was beautiful. It's like a little local gravel race to Michigan. Um, it's called the Moran 166. And so the distance options are 166 miles and 66 miles. So I did the 66 miler and I reached out to them and I said, what, like, what's the cutoff time? And the, and whoever responded on the Instagram account was like, as long as you can make it back by the time the last person doing the 166 finishes, you're fine. He's like, last year, that was like midnight. I was like, cool. <laughs> Between 9am and midnight, I can cover 66 miles. Thank you. And I reached out again and later and I was like, Hey, I see you have this aid station. How long is that aid station going to be open for? Because I don't want to plan on refilling water and Gatorade and then get to, cause this is also gravel races often happen in the middle of nowhere, which really strands you if you aren't fully loaded down with all the water yeah. and, and food that you need. Um, and he was like, yep, it's the last stop for the 166 milers too. So that will be open. I mean, probably until like 10 o'clock at night. So uh, yeah, I just think that there's a lot of comfort that comes with knowledge. And if you can just ask for that knowledge or race directors, if you can be putting that knowledge out there, that is a really, really helpful thing. That is such invaluable advice. I know um, I've been at races where I pulled up and the aid station was getting taken down and, you know, they were instructed to leave up one table of stuff and yeah. the things that were left were all things that I was allergic to. Um, and granted, I, I've been around the block a couple of times. I always have extra food and water and snacks and all that. But there might come a day when I've given that stuff away. Um, so yeah, making sure that that is uh, taken care of. 
Yeah. Um, so that was advice for participants. Actually, Maggie, you haven't said much this episode. Um, I know you've also done quite a few races and events. Um, what advice would you give to folks who are new or uncertain about doing one? So my like just standard advice that I give people on pretty much anything in life right now is stupid is loud. Um, so like if you're considering doing a bike race and you've heard the stories about people being mean or race directors being hard to get along with, or like with us, uh, aid stations, I actually, one of the rides I do most frequently in North Carolina, I, I trained all year to do the ride and hit the only aid station to refill. And I was pulling up to where it was supposed to be, could tell it was not there. There was a truck coming towards me. And I realized I had coolers and tables and stuff in the back of the truck. And the guy rolled the window down. He's like, do you know how to get back? And I said, yeah. He goes, do you need anything? I was like, I guess not. He was like, have a good day. And just like sped off down the road. Oh, so like you hear those things. Stupid is loud. So those things are all going to sound like that's how it is everywhere. But in my experience, most of the people that I've interacted with at events are super cool. They're glad you're there. They're glad to help you if you have any kind of issue. They're glad to, like the the one guy in Steamboat last year that I always think of, I got on him right, or I walked up beside him right as he was going into severe leg cramps in both legs. Stranger, like, and I was just like, do you need anything? Cause that's my standard go-to. Like, I'll leave you alone, but do you need something? And he looks at me and he goes, I need you to just walk and talk with me. Or you're going to have a grown man crying on your bicycle. And I was like, great. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> and I would, I would say my advice to people is that is the majority of the things that are going to happen. And if any of the rest of us hear somebody do the stupid to you, <laughs> oh, it's going to be a really bad day for them. So yes. Don't let the loud stupid keep you from doing something that you're going to fall in love with. Yeah, yeah. we're all rooting for you. Also, yeah. at the end of the day, it's just a bike ride. It might be the longest since you ever done Absolutely. distance. It might be your first like official event. But at the end of the day, you're still just pedaling your bicycle. You know how to do that. Yeah. Um, and then my other tip is eat and drink all day long. Um, bring more snacks yeah. you you're going to need. Bring more water. And as soon as you start getting sad, just remember you're not sad. You just need to eat. I, I mean, you it, might actually be sad too, but your <laughs> brain is probably playing tricks on you. I call it like oppressed, like H, like instead of hangry, I get, I get real uh, sad. Like, get real, Wait, I don't get it. Ho-pressed oh, or? Oh, huh, like, like, like hungry, hungry meat. <laughs> oppressed. <laughs> Not I was oppressed. like, ho-pressed. Ho-pressed. No, all right, yeah. where's she at? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know her, but I'd like to. Um, <laughs> she sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually, uh, if you have a bike computer, which I know that not everybody does, but if you do the settings to remind you to, you can put little things there to remind you to eat and drink. And like when I did the Moran 66, I was with, traveling with a good friend who was doing the longer distance one. And he and I sat in our hotel room the night before and like, like typed in like all these like little inside jokes and like funny little yes. things, like all day on my bike computer, I was getting like random like memories and funny little things. Um, but the food and water reminders, because I will just, I have ADHD. So I am just a lost cause when it comes to remembering to do anything at a regular interval. Oh, um, same. The bike computer reminders are the reason I'm still standing, I think. So yes. Yeah. Last year I started putting in reminders to have a good time. And I remember last year when I was at Unbound and trudging through that mile section of 10 inch mud, it popped up and said, have a good time. And I just had to laugh. I had to giggle yeah. at myself and remind myself that, yeah, we chose to do this. Like, this it's is fun. what we make of it. And this yeah. is what we call fun. Yeah. And it definitely helped turn my spirits around in that moment when I was like, why? So, yes. What advice do you have for event directors or um, race directors? Yeah. Race directors. Um, the easiest and freest thing that you can do is to communicate. So all of these things that we're talking about with like being worried about time cutoffs and making it to the finish line in time. And is the aid station going to be open? You can make your race more appealing to me by typing those like three things out in one sentence and putting them on your website, because I will read your yeah. website and I will look for more. Um, and so I think that that is really sort of my biggest thing is I just need you to communicate and be aware that not everybody doing your race is going to be going, is going to be racing with the A group Peloton. Um, and that uh, you can make your race a more welcoming place just by 
giving me the information that you definitely already know, right? Like you already have in your head, yeah. I'm the finish line's going to close. What time, how, like what time you need volunteers at aid stations and things like that. Um, and just by, by talking about that, that is, that's a huge help. And t-shirt sizes, like Marley mentioned, offer, offer a variety of sizes if you can, because that's what people, people want to buy shirts for a race that they did. And it sucks to get, to do this really hard race and finish it and then go buy a shirt and all they have is a large. And I'm like, well, cool. That's not even a good crop top for me. So like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that, but yeah, I think those are two of the, two of the most important things. Um, I also, um, offering multiple distances is a really good way to do that. Sort of as we've already, we've already covered. Um, if you can make your race, uh, and you know, stagger leaving times, even, um, there's a, a guy in the Detroit, or actually in the Ann Arbor area near Detroit, who puts on some gravel rides. Um, and what he does is he staggers the start times based on the distance so that everybody finishes around the same time and you get to have the big party together. Cause that's, the fun part of it right and so and I even messaged him and I was like hey I'm doing the 35 miler but it might take me a minute can I start with the 60 milers and he was like yeah whatever like time it for when you want to finish right so um I think doing that kind of thing really sort of helps promote that's the good vibe of cycling right is when you have you know we might have had two completely different days but we're sharing a burrito at the food truck after talking about how our day went um and if any event directors are listening to this burritos are my preferred after <laughs> after <laughs> this food. If that just can't be made I will accept a burrito okay um, all right it's but good also, information to have yeah absolutely I think people want to know um if you can keep the party going at your finish line like that is that like make it a big deal to cheer in the last finisher like I think there are people who maybe feel shame about being last but that is pretty quickly wiped away by like a bunch of people cheering for you, right? And so um, having people, the Iron Man actually does a decent job of that at their full distances where the first finishers come back later and like run in some of the final finishers. And so for Iron Man, those are usually like very famous pro triathletes, but- um, Oh, just, I have goosebumps hearing that. Yeah. It's, you Google videos of it and have yourself a little cry because it is very sweet. Sounds <laughs> um, right. So. I've been at two gravel races where they do that. Um, the first was at mid South, which is coming up here in a few weeks. Yes. And the reason why I signed up for the hundred miler is because of the finish line party last year for those folks who came in last yeah. there was, pro it, I think it was midnight. There was at least a hundred people at the finish line, including like Pete Stetna, who I don't know if he won that day or like he, he was one of the top racers and, you know, his mechanic, big tall Wayne, there were a couple other pros and Bobby is just waiting there at the finish line to give you the biggest hug of your life. And I'm like. I want that celebration after a hundred miles in Oklahoma. Um, so I'm supposed to be training right now for that, but it's, I don't know. It's going like all my other training. It's just a bike Ice ride, thunder. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, and then the other one was rooted Vermont. So I was a little bit pissed about this one. Cause I was like third from DFL in my distance or for those that don't know, it's dead effing last. Um, it, <laughs> it kind of has an awful name, but like, it's a badge of honor. Um, yeah. And the guy who came in last, Frank, was, um, he was super charismatic, had made friends all weekend. And so the announcers were letting everybody know, hey, Frank's about five miles out. You know, we're going to want everybody at the finish line when he gets here. And that race finishes on the side of a ski hill. And so when they told us, all right, Frank's in sight, everybody come cheer him on. And I have a video of it, of like a hundred people just running up the side of the ski hill to cheer him in on the single track. It was just so heartwarming and amazing and like you said Nikki like we're yeah. all out there doing the thing and just because yeah. we didn't finish in six hours or four hours you know it took us 14 hours doesn't mean we didn't work just as hard and deserve just as much celebration yes absolutely um that is the, exactly what I'm talking about right is that vibe of like I dream of being Frank right like exactly. <laughs> it's my presence <laughs> I'm coming <laughs> like <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that's exactly the kind of vibe you want to cultivate at a at an event like that, right? Where you're, um, I sort of had like a mini version of that experience at the, the Moran race that I did. I was one of the last finishers uh, in the distance that I did. And the top like five, so the friend that I went with is a very, very fast cyclist. So he was doing the, the longer, the, he was doing a hundred miles more than me that day. And I joked the whole day before my only goal was to finish before he did. And I did not, he, they started like an hour earlier. He passed me like a mile from the finish line. And I was like, oh, gosh, dang it. But like, <laughs> there to see me finish and like, 
uh, I was one of the last people in my distance to finish. And so there was kind of a big break between the first handful of di longer distance finishers and then like the rest of them that were still coming. And man, people were just screaming for me as I came into the, like, as I came into the finish line. And that was like a pretty cool, um, a pretty cool experience. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. Hype people up. You want yeah, people, to yeah. people feel good. That's yeah. That's how you do that. So to recap, just to make sure I got it right. One, over communicate. This is for race directors. We want you to over communicate. Two, have shorter distances. And three, yep. celebrate till the end. Is that right? Celebrate till the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a perfect summation of that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Such like good, invaluable advice. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are coming close to the end here, but we have a couple more questions to ask you. And they're they're oh. questions that we ask almost all of our guests. Okay. Um, what's on your agenda for this year? Ooh, good question. I'm very excited for this year. So I, like you mentioned, I'm moving from Detroit. I've lived in the Detroit area my entire life. I've lived in the city itself for 10 years to Michigan's Upper Peninsula, um, which like even my own sister was like, why are you doing that? And then she was like, <laughs> oh, they have a big B in a Starbucks. And I was like, yes, it's an actual, it's a proper city. It's a college town. There's a Thai restaurant. It's all right. Um, <laughs> So, but it is surrounded by a whole lot of wilderness, right? It's a largely undeveloped uh, area. I think it, it holds like 40% of Michigan's land mass, but only 3% of its population or something like uh, that. Very big outdoorsy area. So I'm just- You might've already said this. Is this the Upper Peninsula area? The Upper Peninsula. Like yeah. Michigan looks like this? <laughs> and it's the top part. Okay. It's, uh oh, here. It's on this side. I can point. <laughs> point if you're down. not- Obviously, you guys can't hear us or see us doing this, but we've got our hand up like a. We're doing the mitten. Like Michigan. Yeah. It's the upper part that goes sideways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Very cool. Uh, yeah, and I'm doing it because I want more outdoor adventures and I want them to be more convenient to me. Um, and so the the two races I'm signed up so far, I'm doing the Moran 66 again, because um, props to them. That was a really great race experience. They were friendly. The race was incredible. Um, and the other one I'm doing is called Crusher, which is a. Yes, a very, uh, I've been told that it's the race that that started the should I ride my gravel bike or my mountain bike debate, um, because it's very, very rough gravel, um, not really a lot of single track, just <laughs> gravel that <laughs> is in bad shape, um, <laughs> or good shape, depending on your attitude, which is what I'm trying to adopt. Yeah. Um, I chose this race because it's known for being so rugged um, and you do like river crossings and um, the whole thing is like either finish or you don't like they don't really do like places or anything like that. Um, and the race director in some of his promotion of the event has said, uh, if you're fast, good for you. And if you're not, you don't have to be. And so I just really appreciate that. I like that. Attitude. Um, So I'm doing the 40 miler, which is well known for being like at least a 50 miler. Um, Cause <laughs> it's like a mental game of like, you think you're dumb, but you're not. Um, so yeah, that is, that's where I'm at this year is just more bike adventures and taking the time to yeah. stop and look at cool things and take breaks. And, um, and you are heading up an all bodies on bikes chapter. Yes, that right? and, yes, that is also a big deal. Um, and so from Marquette, any Marquetteans listening to this? Is that what you guys go by? I'll have to learn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's a big Michiganian versus Michigander debate. And so I'm, you know, people are a little sensitive around here. Um, so <laughs> to, I've to, learned so much today. I know. Yeah. Oh, man. We want to talk about Michigan. This is just the beginning. Um, so <laughs> I'm super excited to start an All Bodies on Bikes chapter up there. Um, mountain biking is a much bigger deal. There's a bunch of mountain bike trails you can access from downtown Marquette. And so hoping to get some more people out on mountain bikes who maybe haven't been out before um, and do some stuff around that. So, yeah. Awesome. A Heck yeah. Okay. So what is what would be your dream day on a bike? Oh, man. Uh, we've already mentioned water. There should be sure. some sort of swim involved. Absolutely. Uh, wait, wait, I got a question for you on this. Yes. If you, I, cause I don't know what you wear when you ride bikes, but if you like Ooh. pull up to a swimming hole, are you the type of person who like strips all the way down or are you getting in your bibs and sports bra and Jersey? What do you normally do? So because I live in an area that's very populated, I'm not getting fully naked. <laughs> in <laughs> of water. I mean, uh, you know? if, if, if I were like alone or like just with my, my group of friends, I would skinny dip. I'm, 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 I'm bothered by that. Um, but I do ride, I ride in like a kit mostly like, like it bibs and I, some kind of Jersey for the most part, um, especially on longer rides and maybe it's the triathlete in me, but I just swim in that and then it dries off eventually. Um, and then I change as soon as I get home. Cause I feel yucky one or the other. Um, so yeah, normally I would just jump in and, and whatever I'm wearing. I'm uh, the same way. I, yeah. one time I forgot to take my helmet and my heart rate drop off. Turns out they're both fairly waterproof. Yeah. Fantastic. 
My thing, I've seen several videos this week of people coming to like creek crossings and taking their socks and shoes off, Ooh. crossing the creek. So barefoot on slippery, wet rocks. Oh. And then they put their socks and shoes back on. And I'm like, I have never, I wouldn't, why would you, I don't yeah. understand. It does yeah. not compute to my I brain. I think I would feel more safe doing that than I would in my like my like mountain bike clip-in shoes which is why i normally ride on my gravel bike and see I, I have just never thought of it i just oh. clip clipless shoes and right in in the water i go if i feel confident i try and ride through creek crossings that's one thing i have a skill that i've learned since moving to the ozarks yeah. and granted every creek is different but if it looks rideable and the person in front of me did it i just usually close my eyes and say I mean, <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest thing that I have had to learn in mountain biking is that you you have to close your eyes and pedal faster because that, <laughs> that increases your ability to go over something like by like 80%. Whereas if you slam on the brakes at the last second, that's where injuries happen, right? Yeah. yeah. And maybe don't close your eyes. Um, but yeah, you do have to keep the momentum going. A rolling bicycle is much less likely to let you fall off it than yeah. when you slam on your brake your brakes. Yep. Okay, that's wait, not... sorry. I totally interrupt you. It's going to include oh, water. Okay. Your dream day on a bicycle. Yes. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you if you've ever done any track riding, like on an indoor velodrome. No, I yeah. want to. That was the first thing I was told when I started riding. I took like a velodrome one-on-one class because we we're lucky in Detroit. We have a, a really nice velodrome here. Um, was they were like, you're going to cut the, the corners of it are so steep that they're like, your brain is going to tell you to break. You have to pedal faster. And so I did. I closed my eyes and I pedaled faster and then I screamed the whole time, but I made it around. Um, so yeah, my ideal ride definitely involves uh, some sort of water, definitely involves uh I mean, ideally we're bouncing from like brewery and coffee shop and restaurant, you know, like it's like a progressive dinner to be a little bit, maybe too Lutheran, but, um, uh, <laughs> choose do it too. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Baptist may have invented it. I'm can't oh, be entirely okay. sure, but as long as there's fried chicken, we're fine. Yeah. Huh. I don't know why I grew up thinking that was a Lutheran thing. All right. We've got progressive dinner on, on a bike. Right. And, and sort of riding around and good friends and nobody's worried about the pace and yeah and a nice swimming hole to jump into at the end of it Heck yeah so, yeah that sounds like a perfect day it and does. then we have one very last question i'm let maggie ask it because i she came up with this question and i freaking love this question um right so yeah okay nikki we had you on to talk about bikes but you're into a lot of stuff what is something you wish you had a chance to talk to more people about oh what a great question public transportation interesting okay i love it tell us more are you a fan do you hate it what's going on i love public transportation i actually went to chicago uh not that long ago and um yeah just the ability to like like i there aren't really any cities in michigan detroit especially has oh i could talk for days about how off our public transportation is here um and how we build a three mile long absolutely useless like many millions of dollars light rail um but just the ability to like not have a car and like ride everywhere you want to go and have like safer and more walkable streets that's like a lot of what the league of michigan bicyclists where i work it's a lot of what we do is help cities build bike lanes um yeah yeah not having to rely on cars is a good thing a net positive for our world I think but not attainable in most of the U.S. so definitely yeah. um that's that was it's been a hard lesson for me to learn since moving to Arkansas because in Seattle I lived car free for 10 years mm-hmm. um and I had a car my last couple of years there but I hardly ever drove it and now in Arkansas it's like oh I want to go to the vet okay I can cross three really scary streets and not have a bike lane or I can drive um oh. so that's the not- when the distance is completely doable, doable. The, yeah. The safety's not there. The yeah, absolutely. I heard a crazy statistic one time that like 90% of US car trips are less than three miles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't want to like get too much into that, like, because it can be a little bit ableist to say, well, people should be able to ride a bike or walk. There will always be people who, for whatever reason, can't do that. But yeah. public transportation is a huge thing. Yep. So yeah. I don't know. I just saw something come up on Twitter that um, Biden is doing something with Amtrak today. So maybe Ooh. some new investment in public infrastructure. Who knows? That would be brilliant. I would love um, that. So in closing, Nikki, where can folks uh, find you and learn more about all the work you're doing and what's going on with the Michigan chapter of All Bodies on Bikes? Yes. Um, you can, for now, me on Instagram is probably the best way. Although if you search All Bodies on Bikes Marquette, uh, there is a Marquette is M-A-R-Q-U-E-T-T-E. Um, that Instagram will pop up. I haven't 
put any pretty looking graphics on it yet, but I can, I can take care of that. Um, and I am on Instagram. It's my favorite social media. Uh, I am at Bicky Nates, B-I-C-K-Y-N-A-T-E-S. Um, yeah, I post lots of pictures of bike rides and also food. So <laughs> two of our two favorite of things favorite. Yeah, exactly. and my favorite things, <laughs> well, so just two of the best it. things. Ex- yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we'll include links to both the All Bodies on Bikes Marquette account and um, your own personal account. Um, and really just want to thank you for your time today. You brought up so many good discussion points. Yes. Um, and if folks have questions for us about this episode or ideas, feel free to email us at info at allbodiesonbikes.com um, or podcast at allbodiesonbikes.com. They both go to the same place um, or reach out on Instagram or Facebook. Thanks for being yeah. here, Nikki. Amazing. Thanks for having me. This is an All Bodies on Bikes podcast powered by Feisty Media. The show is produced by Maggie and Marley and edited by the team at Feisty Media. Thanks for listening.